If I asked you to imagine the most stereotypical Jewish American profession, you'd probably think lawyer, doctor, movie producer. You probably wouldn't think pro baseball player and Nazi hunting CIA spy. And not just because that's a mouthful. But Mo Berg was anything but stereotypical. So how did a nice Jewish boy from Newark end up a pro athlete and CIA spy? For a pretty exceptional guy, Mo Berg had a pretty unremarkable childhood, at least for an American Jew born in the early 1900s. You know, immigrant parents, lived in a tenement, lied about his last name to avoid anti-Semitic bullying from the neighborhood kids. Mo's brains were anything but standard. By the age of three, he was begging his mom to let him go to school, where he turned out to be one of those annoying kids who was good at everything. And I do mean everything. Sports, academics, languages, having a photographic memory. It's no surprise he ended up at Princeton, where his skills attracted the attention of Major League Baseball scouts. But for all his success on the diamond, Mo often felt like an outsider. After all, he was in one of the fanciest, waspiest institutions of 1920s America. Being a Jew wasn't exactly an asset. Things started looking up for Mo when he landed a spot on the Brooklyn Robins. When he wasn't on the field, he was in the classroom, eventually earning a law degree from Columbia in between baseball seasons. He played for some of the biggest teams around, like the White Sox and the Red Sox. The reason we don't know Mo's name is because he was playing alongside some of the greatest of all time, like Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, who he toured with to Japan. And it was this 1934 tour that would change the course of his life. See, Mo brought a portable film camera with him to Japan, which he used to film, well, basically everything he saw. He wasn't just being a cringy tourist though. There are different accounts as to why he showed up with a camera. Some believe that he'd been recruited by the government, which was keeping an eye on Japan. Others say that he'd offered his services to a newsreel production company, because why relax when you can work nonstop? Whatever the reason, Mo filmed all of downtown Tokyo, the buildings, the harbor, the sights. But for nearly a decade, the footage sat somewhere in his house, an exotic souvenir from a stint in East Asia. After his world tour, Mo took a step back from playing. Instead, he did all the normal things that aging athletes do. He coached rookies. He wrote an essay that the New York Times called one of the most insightful works ever penned about baseball. He went on radio quiz shows, fluidly answering question after question like a 1930s Ken Jennings. Okay, maybe he wasn't exactly your standard aging athlete. And when Japan attacked the US in December of 1941, Berg really broke the mold for aging athletes. He started working for the government, eventually landing a position with the OSS. That's the United States Office of Strategic Services, which would eventually become the CIA. What did an American intelligence agency want from a semi-retired athlete? For one, Mo had a fluent command of multiple languages. Plus, the guy was a coach and an athlete. So he was a pretty good candidate to train his fellow Americans for secret parachute drops into enemy territory. He was also a good candidate to oversee the kidnapping of Italian rocket scientists. Yep, that was a real thing that the US government did. I don't think that Mo tossed any scientists into a burlap sack and ran off across the border or anything. But he did manage to coax a high level Italian aeronautic engineer to the US. Okay, so maybe it was less kidnapping, more sweet talking. Whatever his methods, Mo Berg had landed a big fish, and President Roosevelt commented, I see Berg is still catching pretty well. Good one, Prez. But Berg's most exciting mission didn't rely on his athletic skills. It relied on his famous brain. The American government was understandably very concerned about the Nazis' nuclear project. If the Axis powers managed to get their hands on serious nuclear technology, our modern world would look a lot like an episode of The Man in the High Castle. See you. No, thank you. So the OSS sent Mo to Switzerland to hang out with a guy you might have heard of if you've ever taken high school chemistry or watched Breaking Bad. Say my name. Heisenberg. Werner Heisenberg was one of the major scientists behind the Nazis' nuclear program. In between his nuclear research, he lectured abroad. I've never been to a high-level physics lecture, so I can't say for sure, but I think they're pretty tough for most people to understand. Not Mo. He came to Heisenberg's lecture with three things, a self-taught overview of nuclear physics, a pistol, and a clear directive from his bosses at the OSS. 
If Heisenberg indicated at any point that Germany was close to developing a bomb, Mo was told to shoot him on the spot. I guess that's one way to spice up a physics lecture. Lucky for Heisenberg, the Germans weren't close to developing a nuke. But the only way to know was to send a man who not only understood science jargon, but also could ask intelligent questions about said jargon in a variety of languages. So Berg returned to the United States, and in time, the United States returned to the status quo. The OSS disbanded. The government started handing out medals to all the heroes of the war effort, including Mo. But he refused to accept the Medal of Freedom, saying it embarrassed him. Mo's brother said later that he was different after the war, moody, irritable, listless. No one's really certain why. Maybe it's because the CIA refused Mo's request to send him to the newly created State of Israel in the early 1950s. Or maybe it's because his very last mission for the organization ended in failure. He'd made some valuable contacts during World War II, and the CIA was very interested in what those contacts knew about the Soviets' nuclear project. But Berg came back from Europe with nothing. After that mission flopped, Berg never really worked again. Not as an athlete, not as a coach, not as a writer, though he turned down a bunch of opportunities to write his memoirs. He disappeared from public life and moved in with his siblings. He wasn't a total shut-in. He traveled and saw close friends. But as he got older, he spent much of his time absorbed in his books. I don't know if any of his neighbors even knew that the guy had once been a major league baseball player and a decorated spy. Well, sort of decorated. Does it count if you refuse your decoration? But Mo was a baseball lover through and through. His last words, according to his nurse, were, how did the Mets do today? After his death, his sister accepted his long deferred Medal of Freedom and donated it to the Baseball Hall of Fame. I don't know how Berg would have felt about that if he were still alive today, but I'm glad he's being recognized if not as the best baseball player ever, then as a patriot, a polymath, and a remarkable Jewish American.